It was a tragic day for comic book fans everywhere when we learned that issue number 18 of Hellions was going to be its last. Not only was the team going to be broken up, but two of its founding members, and in fact, if you ask me, the two breakout stars of the entire series, Nanny and Orphan Maker, were both being sent into the pit for crimes against humanity. Orphan Maker committed the worst crime a Krakoan citizen can commit when he killed a bunch of humans on his quest to seek absolution in the eyes of Nanny. Because of this, he was sentenced to exile by the Quiet Council, and Nanny, being the ever-responsible Nanny that she is, decided to tag along with him in the banishment. It was a heartbreaking send-off that was mired in ethical concern and sparked some debate amongst the Quiet Council as to whether or not Orphan Maker was really of sound mind to know what he was doing. As a super fan of Nanny, my little heart cried at seeing her sacrifice herself for Peter, but from a storytelling perspective, I mean, man, all of this was so great. This makes Orphan Maker the second person that we know of to be sent to Kirkoan jail, and Nanny the third, though hers is more like a self-imposed sentencing. They both join Sabretooth, who has been down there in the pit since the beginning days of Krakoa, and as the cast of exiled mutants finally starts to grow, I can't help but wonder when we're gonna get a peek at what these bad boys and girls have been up to ever since going down under. Hopefully, the Sabretooth miniseries that's due out this winter will shed some light on the dank and dark happenings that's going on in the underbelly of Krakoa. We've been living in a blessed golden age of X-Men thanks to this new Krakoan era, and though our cups runneth over with almost too many books on store shelves, by and large, Hellions was undoubtedly one of the best. Hellions was basically X-Men's answer to the Thunderbolts, where a bunch of kind of reformed, but not really reformed, villains go out on X-Men missions to prove that they can play nice, but really the true grit of the series was always in the intra-team dynamics of this wildly diverse group. The oddball casting choices is what really piqued my interest about this series in the first place, and even though X-Men mainstays like Havoc and Psylocke aren't really weird choices at all to have on a team, pretty much everyone else here was. It was basically a team of like B and C list characters who were somehow conscripted into headlining their own book, and I absolutely love that premise. Hands down, I was most looking forward to Nanny and Orphan Maker. I am huge fans of those two ever since I splurged $25 in my youth at a flea market for what became my favorite issue of all time, Uncanny X-Men number 248, where Nanny and Orphan Maker almost take out the entire X-Team by themselves. I just think that Nanny as a character overall is so funny and so unique, and I love the bizarre little nursery rhymes that she comes up with. These two twisted souls haven't really made a ton of appearances in X-Men comics, so plucking them out of their obscurity and putting them on this team was quite the gamble for Marvel, since not a lot of casual fans would have known who these two people even are. The hard part in really delivering on a team like the Hellions is making sure to write each character's distinct voice correctly so that they don't just all like blend together like a bunch of murderous evildoers. Nanny and Orphan Maker both have very specific points of view, and nailing their sentence structures and tone and delivery is really what makes them so appealing and different when compared to most other characters. As the Nanny superfan that I am, you can be sure that her characterization was under my microscope for this entire series, and I was very happy that in 18 issues, I definitely felt that her essence was there and represented and channeled, and that I was getting the Nanny that I loved while also seeing some new growth and character development from her. So what I want to do in this video is get into the entire character histories of Nanny and Orphan Maker and explore their warped call to action from their earliest appearances right up till today. Nanny's real name is Eleanor Mulch, and she was a brilliant cyborg technologist who used to work for The Right. The Right is an anti-mutant hate group that was founded by the X-Men's friend-turned-foe Cameron Hodge. It's an organization with one mission and one mission only, and that is to destroy all mutants. And it uses smiley-faced robots in order to achieve that, which, presumably, Nanny helped to create. At the time, Eleanor didn't know that the Right was a terrorist organization, though, and her being a mutant herself, she sought to stop them after she discovered the truth. 
She was overpowered, though, and the right ended up trapping her inside her iconic egg-shaped armor, which apparently also drove her a little bit insane. From there, Nanny began her crusade to save mutant children from adult oppressors, whether the children needed saving or not. She refused to let organizations like the right harm mutant children, and it became her personal mission to see to their safety, or at least to see to whatever she saw their safety as. In her first successful conquest, she recruited Peter, and he became her orphan maker, and like his name suggests, his job would be to go around killing mutant children's parents, effectively making them orphans, and thus eligible for Nanny's help. The whole thing is very much a self-fulfilling prophecy for her, where she creates the situation in order to necessitate her own involvement. She and Orphan Maker flew around in her weird-looking insect ship during the early X-Factor days and killed and kidnapped lots of people in order for Nanny to make her own little supergroup of lost boys and girls. They got involved in the Inferno storyline, and Nanny managed to hijack a list of babies that the Wright and Mystere were planning on sacrificing, and she made it her mission to get to them first. She succeeded for the most part, and Nastir's plan was being confounded by her meddling, even though they didn't even know it was Nanny who was involved at all. It feels like Nanny was doing a good thing here, but she was still instructing Orphan Maker to kill the baby's parents, so not exactly as altruistic as it seems. Nanny's quest eventually took her to the very orphanage where Cyclops grew up in, and where he and Jean Grey were currently looking for his lost son, Nathan Christopher, aka the boy who would become Cable. They found him below in Mr. Sinister's secret lab that was full of other mutant children, just as Nanny and her team of lost boys and girls broke in, ready to enact their own form of rescue. Chaos broke out as both Nanny and X-Factor wanted to rescue the kids for themselves, and through their mutual distraction, Nastir's Inferno demons slinked in and kidnapped a bunch of the babies, Nathan Christopher included. Talk about a messiah complex. Nanny was furious and made a quick retreat with her team, vowing to rescue the babies from the demons. Along the way, she came across Franklin Richards' mutant signature, and she sent Orpha Maker down to acquire him. He was unable to kill Franklin's parents though, them being Mr. Fantastic and Invisible Woman of the Fantastic Four, and when his parents discovered that Franklin had been kidnapped, they locked onto Nanny's ship and chased after her. Nanny was super cross at Peter for not having killed the parents, as this is just the kind of problems that can arise when the kids aren't orphaned, and she sent him back out there to fight them and finish the job. He did alright against the superheroes, but as the tide was turning in their favor, Nanny's latest recruit joined the fracas, and that was Franklin Richards himself, inside some of Nanny's weird armor. Franklin was trapped and under Nanny's enchantment, so he fought his parents with all his might, but still it wasn't good enough, and they defeated him while Nanny and Orphan Maker made their getaway. After Inferno ended and the Inferno babies weren't sacrificed after all, Nanny resumed her quest to save them, and she broke into an X-Factor ship where they were being held, hoping to finally rid herself of X-Factor and get those babies into her care. Nanny and X-Factor fought, but it was a pretty short-lived battle, and X-Factor overpowered the child specialist duo, thus the Inferno babies were saved yet again from Nanny's dreadful daycare. The next time Nanny showed up, it was to save the X-Men from the impending attack on them by the Reavers. Nanny had been spying on Donald Pierce, and she knew that he and his cybernetic gang headed out for the X-Men, so even though the X-Men weren't babies, she still considered them orphans of society, and so it was her duty to adopt them in order to save them from certain death. The X-Men had just lost Rogue after a battle with Master Mold, and they were licking their wounds in their Australian Outback HQ when Annie showed up and started capturing them one by one. First, she bewitched Psylocke with her pixie dust, then Orphan Maker trapped Dazzler and Havoc while they were out for a sexy run, and then Nanny armored them all up and had them hunt for Colossus. She almost got her hands on Jubilee too, who was hiding out in the X-Men's headquarters with their knowledge, but Jubes somehow got the best of her. Luckily, Storm showed up when she did, and she started taking out all the mind-controlled X-Men. Nanny and Orphan Maker realized their plan was foiled, and tried to make their escape via Nanny's ship, but Storm pursued them, and then, in a moment of panic, a woozy havoc lashed out to keep Nanny from flying away, and it looked like he succeeded a bit too well, having destroyed the ship and killing Storm in the process. 
But of course that wasn't the case at all, as the storm corpse that the X-Men saw was actually just a life model decoy mannequin of her, and the ship remains were also just a decoy as Nanny and Peter had successfully made their getaway with the real storm in tow. They brought her on board and began the process of de-aging her, turning her from an adult into a child, and wiping her memories so that she could join Nanny's orphan-making brigade and be shaped and modeled by Nanny's values. Storm is a resilient one though, and even though Nanny had the cutest of armored uniforms ready for her, Storm escaped knowing that something here just wasn't right. Even though she didn't remember her time with the X-Men, she kept getting flashes of them and having nightmares of Nanny, so her innermost self was trying to guide her and she knew she had to trust her instincts. Nanny chased after her, becoming more and more worried as Storm teamed up with Gambit and they both became prey to the Shadow King. While the Shadow King and his hounds pursued Gambit and Storm, Nanny finally tracked them down too, and she managed to kidnap Gambit, and she brought him inside her ship in order to de-age him and use his charm in helping them to find Storm. Inside Nanny's ship, all of Storm's memories about her transformation came back to her, and she donned some of Nanny's special armor in order to enact a rescue mission of her own, and stop Nanny from doing the same de-aging process on Gambit as she had done to her. Together, Gambit and Storm overpowered Nanny, and they sent her ship crashing down while the two of them made their escape. That was Nanny and Orphan Maker's last big exploit for a while, until they turned up many years later to trouble the Generation X kids. A young mutant named Elliot was holding his school hostage out of revenge for being expelled, and the Gen X kids were on the scene hoping to keep things peaceful between him and the locals while everything got sorted out. That's when Orvin Maker burst out of his and Nanny's latest ride, which was an ice cream truck, and he began demanding that Elliot come with him. Orphan Maker had begun to grow out of his previous armor, so Nanny had built him a new containment suit, but it wasn't enough to best the next generation of mutants, and he and Nanny were forced to make a retreat before even making contact with Elliot. They soon got their revenge on Generation X though, as Orphan Maker ambushed a bunch of them in the mall one Christmas Eve, and managed to subdue pretty much the entire team in one fell swoop. He brought them back to Nanny's creepy ship, and then set out to make an orphan of the latest mutant child that Nanny had discovered. Jubilee interrupted him and saved the parents before Orphan Maker could kill them, but he did manage to escape with the child. Turns out it was the wrong child though, and when Nanny sent him back to get the correct child, he was surprised to see Santa Claus there. Santa told Peter that he'd been a bad boy this year, which put him at odds with his mission, and since Orphan Maker is basically just a child in the armor, he didn't know what to do. Luckily, Nanny ran into some trouble of her own and summoned him back, so he didn't end up having to complete his mission anyway, and when he returned, he found that the Gen Xers were gone and Nanny was wrapped up like a present. And then it was a pretty miscellaneous life for these two for a while. They showed up in the oddball 90s comic Slingers, which was a book that was basically about a bunch of teched up New Warriors-esque teen heroes. Ricochet was the mutant of the team, and he had been on Nanny's radar for a while, as it showed that she and Orphan Maker were the ones responsible for brutally killing his mother back when he was younger, in hopes of making an orphan out of him back then. They didn't get Ricochet back then, so now Nanny wanted to tie up loose ends and recruit him as one of her lost boys now. She sent Orphan Maker out to kidnap him and bring him back to their ship, where she revealed that she was the one who killed his mother. That didn't go over well, and Ricochet managed to escape and crash in his ship just in time, as Orphan Maker was about to make short work of Ricochet's father in hopes of finally making him a true orphan. Ricochet defeated Orphan Maker too, but as usual, he and Nanny hightailed it before any proper authorities could do anything with them. The last time Nanny vexed the X-Men was whenever she and Orphan Maker kidnapped Trance from the new X-Men team. Orphan Maker destroyed Trance's parents' house, but thanks to Wolverine's intervention, he didn't get a chance to kill her actual parents, and he brought both Trance and Wolverine to Nanny's ship. Nanny planned to de-age Wolverine, just like she was going to do to Gambit and what she did do to Storm, so that he and Trance could both join her orphan-making squad, but Trance lashed out with her astral form, and together she and Wolverine immobilized the villains until they could make a getaway. 
Nanny and Orphan Maker also made a brief appearance during the Uncanny X-Men Disassembled era, when Cyclops' team was hunting down all the threats that ever ailed the X-Men over the years. They located Nanny and Orphan Maker stationed out in a log cabin in the woods, and even though it looked like overkill, the whole X-Men team attacked and managed to subdue both of them without too much of a struggle. And then, after that, all was quiet on the Nanny and Orphan Maker front until they were recruited to be starring members of the Hellions team. The Quiet Council decreed that it was necessary to form a team of people who were having a hard time adjusting to Krakoan life in hopes that working together could help socialize them or something. And Nanny and Orphan Maker were both picked due to their unhealthy codependence on each other. Psylocke was selected as the team's leader, and under Mr. Sinister's orders, they went on various missions like destroying Sinister's clone farm at the very orphanage where Nanny and Orphan Maker once battled Cyclops and Marvel Girl for Baby Cable and the Inferno Children. The Hellions had to battle some zombified marauders and Madeline Pryor, who was aptly in her Goblin Queen guise, but they did the job and the clone farm was destroyed. The Hellions were then charged by the Krakoan Council to enter Arako through the back door of Otherworld during the Ten of Swords event, and try to steal the ten swords that Arako needed in order to complete Saturnine's tournament, thereby ending the tournament before it could even start. The whole thing was a ruse by Sinister just to get genetic sampling of Arako mutants, and they ran afoul of Tarn and his Locust Vile team, where Nanny and Orphan Maker were both killed during battle. Nanny was expedited through the resurrection protocols, but because she died in Arako, she came back a little bit differently and was much more focused and heightened version of herself. Orphan Maker was put on the resurrection fast track as well, but the team required a new containment suit form first in order to keep his X gene in check, and so the Hellions were dispatched to get one from Nanny's old ship, which was being held by the right. While the Hellions fought a seemingly resurrected Cameron Hodge and his smiley robots, Nanny and Wildchild went on to repossess the ship, and in the process, Nanny found a brand new orphan to take care of in the form of an AI smiley baby robot, which she tucked away in secret. With Nanny's Nanny Tech back in her possession, Orphan Maker was finally resurrected, although like Nanny, he too was killed in Morocco, so his genetic structure was also refocused, making him a much more grown boy than he was before, although still with the mind of a child. This is when the cracks in their relationship started to form, as Peter was finally growing up, or at least acting out and asserting some independence against Nanny, and Nanny would play some psychological games against him, where she favored the new little baby robot, which of course would make Peter jealous. When the Hellions were kidnapped by Arcade and Mastermind, Nanny's illusion saw her adopting all the mutant orphans she possibly could, while Orphan Maker's illusion was him being the center of Nanny's attention. When the illusions turned sour, Nanny and Peter were running for their lives from the suddenly turned bloodthirsty orphans who were chasing them down with knives and swords. That adventure ended with Orphan Maker supposedly shooting Arcade, but that didn't happen because the entire kidnapping had been orchestrated by Mr. Sinister anyway so that he could set up a new clone farm and keep it super secret from everyone at Krakoa. A highlight of Nanny's characterization for a lot of people was at the Hellfire Gala, when the Hellions crashed the party and both she and Orphan Maker got super wasted and started telling people off. At the time, I personally wasn't too fond of this depiction, because it was just such a departure from the humor I usually love in her, and she just got super vulgar. But I've warmed up to it more now after the fact, and can acquiesce that it is kind of funny seeing Nanny be so foul-mouthed and out of character, because I guess that was the point of the scene. Nothing much happened plot-wise in this issue, except for more of Nanny's veiled threats to Mr. Sinister, which was a recurring theme in the Hellion series, and of course, some senseless violence when a big brawl broke out. Nanny's big, active through-line throughout Hellions was the little baby robot that she adopted, and Orphan Maker's growing jealousy of the attention that she was giving it. It looked like Nanny was rejecting him, and so Peter actually managed to branch out a bit and find friends on the team in his, like, twisted way, which was pretty much the reason why the Krakoan Council wanted them on the team in the first place, so I guess mission accomplished there. 
When Tarn and the Locust Vile came seeking revenge on Sinister for him having stolen genetic material, Nanny showed a very uncharacteristically ruthlessly violent side, and she and Orban Maker attacked the intruders viciously, which was said to be due to a new fight response they have in the resurrected DNA, where any time they are placed in a situation where they might die again in a similar manner as before, their bodies instinctively react to fight against it. So, since it was the Locust Vile who killed them before, it was now the Locust Vile who were the subjects of their wraths. After the fight, it was revealed that Sinister orchestrated the entire Murder World kidnapping episode, and that he's been splicing Tarn's DNA with his own DNA at his new clone farm, so Empath, Head Havoc, blow the whole system up, destroying all of Sinister's work along with Psylocke's daughter's DNA with it. Not sure if it was the Sinister's betrayal, or the loss of a child's genome, or just the culmination of her hatred that caused Nanny to crack, but it looked like she was finally going to slit Sinister's throat and be done with him forever, until the X-Men showed up and defused the situation. This was basically the end of the Hellions, and Nanny was ready to move on from Peter and care for the robot baby full-time, much to Orphan Maker's dismay. But little did Nanny know that the Wright had been tracking her ship all this time, and as she was nursing the baby, they finally managed to hijack into her systems and take control of it to subdue her. Turns out it wasn't just any old scientist from the Wright, but it was her former husband Harold who was out for revenge against her and wanted to frame her as a traitor to her race. First, he ejected the robot baby and sent it flying back to the Wright's compound, and then he programmed Nanny's ship to collide into Krakoa's Bowery and kill all the mutant babies who were being born and nursed there. The goal was to make Nanny look like a monster in the eyes of her peers, but he failed to consider the ferocity with which Nanny assumes her position as caregiver to little babies, so she initiated a self-destruction of her ship before it could complete its mission. Nanny somehow survived that explosion, and even though Orphan Maker came to her rescue, she ultimately rejected him, upset that her new baby was taken from her. Looking to get back in Nanny's good graces, Orphan Maker went on a solo mission to the Wright's headquarters, hoping to rescue the robot baby and bring it back to Krakoa. Of course, he was in over his head though, so Nanny recruited her other Hellions for one final mission, and together they storm the compound and fight the evil Wright soldiers as Orphan Maker makes his way to where the scientists are holding and experimenting on the baby. Peter's intimidating presence was enough for Harold to yield and hand over the baby, and it's a happy reunion between Nanny and Child until the big shock of the series is revealed, and the baby, though seemingly having been so cute and amiable toward Nanny all this time, suddenly calls her a mutie scum thanks to its programming, and detonates, killing her instantly. Peter is shooketh by this, and in his grief, he goes on a killing rampage, snapping Harold's neck and shooting the other scientists and everybody else who gets in his way, including soldiers and harmless park rangers. He's brought to the Quiet Council to answer for his actions, and there's little debate in what the final result for him will be, even as the other Hellions protest. A resurrected nanny interrupts his sentencing and demands to be sent down into the pit with him, telling the council that if they should refuse her, then she will go on a killing rampage of her own, starting with Kitty's mother, whose exact street address she suspiciously already knows. The council begrudgingly agrees to Nanny's terms, and the two of them get dragged down by Krakoa into exile as Nanny sings to Orphan Maker one of her creepy-ass nanny songs. It's a very sad fate for two somewhat complex characters, and I really hope it's not the end of them. They were a surprising force to be reckoned with on the team, given that their appearances are somewhat unassuming, at least in the case of Nanny. But a big part of why they were so formidable is because of their powers and of Nanny's tech. Nanny's mutant power is a low-level telepathy, which she uses in conjunction with her home-brewed pixie dust in order to sway her victims into her persuasion. The pixie dust is some sort of like hallucinogenic sensory inhibitor, and it's potent enough to be used on its own, even without any telepathy, as Orphan Maker uses it himself sometimes when he's recruiting new kids for the Lost Boys and Girls Club. 
It might be that Nanny's telepathy is only strong enough to be used on the minds of kids, and so that's why she doesn't employ it very often on adults in the way that other telepaths do, like Jean Grey and Emma Frost, but she has been shown that she can use it to nudge people in the direction that she wants them to go in, like when she psychically influenced Havoc to blow up her plane after they captured Storm. With or without her telepathy though, Nanny's most fearsome advantage is her high-level intellect. She's a cyborgist, so she's super good with machines, and some of the things she's invented have even baffled other brilliant minds like Reed Richards. She's a skilled inventor and is the brains behind the Orphan Maker containment suits, which have encased everybody from her own Orphan Maker to a few of the X-Men like Havoc and Dazzler and Psylocke to Omega-powered non-mutants like Franklin Richards. She developed the suits to be super strong and durable, as they've withstood beatings from all kinds of superheroes, though they aren't indestructible, as Wolverine's adamantium claws have previously demonstrated. Whatever the material is that she uses for the suits, it creates like a ricochet effect off them, which causes things to bounce off their surface, like when Cyclops' optic blast kept bouncing off Peter's suit when they were fighting in Sinister's orphanage lab. Nanny can also generate a similar type of repulsor field around her own armor, which she used once against the beast to slide him off of her, and her armor is also equipped with extendable arms so she can grab or punch things from afar, as well as holographic projectors that shoot out of her eyes. I don't think she was the initial creator of her eggshell suit since it was forced onto her by the right, but I assume that she at least improved upon it with these new designs and modifications so that it suits her needs since it became her prison. She has very rarely been seen in the comics without the armor on, and I think the only instances we have seen of her actual body are in the shadowy silhouettes of like when she worked at the right, or while Orphan Maker was bothering Generation X and she was communicating with him from afar. I, for one, am dying to know what she really looks like, and I can't help but feel like it's some sort of hunched over old woman or something like that, which just adds to her appeal to me even more. Even when she was resurrected, she refused to come out of her resurrection pod, instead punching her arms and legs through it and wearing it just like her egg armor, so clearly she's become very attached to that shape. Her ex-husband Harold suggested as much that she wears it by choice now instead of it being a prison since he was also shocked to see her still in it when he confronted her on Krakoa. Probably the scariest part of Nanny's tech that we know about is her de-ager, which she uses on her victims in order to regress them into childhood and make them more susceptible to her wiles. This is the device that she used on Storm in order to turn her into a child and strip her of her adult memories, and she was also going to use it on Wolverine and Gambit as well, and I assume that she was also planning on using it on the entire Australian Outback X-Men team, as Nanny and Orphan Maker can be seen watching hollow images of the team getting progressively younger and younger as they formulate their plan of attack. In terms of weapons for these two, it's usually guns, guns, and more guns. Orphan Maker's suit comes equipped with all kinds of projectiles, and he's been seen blasting everything from lasers to bazookas. Nanny isn't quite as trigger happy as he is though, and the most I've seen her use was like an electrically charged riding crop thing that she really only ever used to punish Orphan Maker when he was getting out of line. After Peter outgrew his original Orphan Maker armor, Nanny upgraded him with some sort of bio armor which could generate its own guns right out of its arms and use bullets made of like bio matter or something. It kind of reminded me of the way that Random can turn his hands into guns or, for a recent example, how Domino can use her Krakoan tech arm to change it into like anything she wants. The same principle seems to apply to Orphan Maker, albeit it's all on that specific suit of armor, and none of it is like his mutant ability or anything. Speaking of his mutant ability, Orphan Maker's X-Gene remains a mystery to this very day. Shortly after they debuted, Nanny indicated that she had rescued him from Sinister, who was planning on killing him because his mutant potential was too terrifying. Charles Xavier asserted as much as well after they put him into the resurrection queue, calling his mutant gift a curse and agreeing that his X gene should never be activated. The mystery surrounding Peter's ability is one of the most interesting unanswered questions of his character, and I hope to God that him being sentenced to the pit doesn't mean that we won't eventually have an answer as to what it is. If it really is as devastating as they all say it is, then it's just a tease for Marvel to give us that information and not deliver on it.
Another thing that I'd like some closure on with these characters is Nanny's vengeance against Sinister. Her animosity toward him all series long was a subtle undercurrent of joy for me, and she would pop up beside him every now and again, reminding him that she was watching him with her big, eggy eyes. Right from the very moment she was first recruited for the team, Nanny wasn't going to be taking any BS from Sinister, and she let him know it in a very polite but chilling Nanny-esque way. Since it's Sinister whom she rescued Peter from way back in the day, it figures that she would be a bit distrusting of him as the Hellions' leader, and also that she would take any excuse to end his life for the violence that he has done children in the past. She almost did that at the end of the series after Havoc blew up Murder World and she took a knife to his throat, but she didn't quite finish the job. Some of Nanny's creepiest moments was when she was politely insulting and threatening him, like when they returned from destroying Sinister's first lab, and she basically told him that she was coming for him. And then again at the Hellfire Gala, when she toasted to his years of murder and abuse of children. She almost killed him at the gala too, so I mean, Nanny obviously has unresolved feelings of hatred that she needs to take out on Sinister, and I for one am totally hoping that we still someday will get to see that. There's also an unresolved story point of how Nanny knows the Shadow King from some time in the past. Maybe they met along the astral plane at some point, as Nanny was very aware of who he was when he was chasing Baby Storm, and she knew all about his evil powers and his ability to turn people into hounds. I think we're less likely to get that story over a Nanny vs. Sinister story, but I mean, I'm totally here for whatever Nanny stories we can get at all. And so, that's it for my epic Nanny and Orphan Maker saga video. As you can tell, I totally love these characters, and even though they met a beautifully tragic end in the Hellion Swan Song issue, my one hope is that through all of the misadventures that they went through with the Krakoan Hellions, that they now have a whole new horde of readers that they can call their fans. If Sabretooth can get his own mini about jailbreaking from the pit, then maybe Nanny and Orphan Maker will get theirs too, and I for one will be first in line to buy it. Let me know what you think about these two characters, and if you have a favorite moment of them from the Hellion series, because honestly, there are just so many good ones. If you like this video, please be sure to check around my channel for more like it. I create summaries and spotlights and reviews of all things X-Men, so there's something for everyone. You can also follow me on social media, where I upload daily panel scans with funny commentary that I hope might give you a chuckle or two. I want to thank you for stopping by and spending some time with me today, and please be sure to come back again soon for more great X-Mentations.